Um, thank you all so much for coming. So I'm really excited today to share with you um, some of the first data out of the lab at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and this project was led by an outstanding undergrad in my lab named Audrey Burr. Um, so she specifically wanted to test whether the order of arrival of two cancer plants changes infection outcomes in the facial Can you guys in the back hear me okay? okay. Um, so just to sort of orient you to what my lab is interested in, in general, we know that most, maybe all species, outsource vital functions to mutualists. To illustrate this, I want to start by thinking about this example of the mutualism between a limber pine tree and Clark's nutcracker. So Clark's nutcracker is the primary species birther for this limber pine tree. Um, so limber pine reproductive success relies on successfully attracting mutualists to disperse their seeds. But limber pines and all other species that rely on mutualists are faced with this conundrum that attracting and forming mutualisms also attract antagonists. So this mutualism isn't an exception to this. Um, limber pines are attacked by arguably the world's most adorable seed predator, the <laughs> limber pine squirrel. Um, this squirrel also eats limber pine cones, but it harvests those cones before they're ripe. Um, so any seeds in squirrel harvested cones aren't going to germinate. So if you're a limber pine tree, this sets up this trade-off between attracting mutualists that disperse your seeds and repelling antagonists that harm your reproductive system. We can think about this trade-off in such a way that individuals or genotypes that are really good at attracting mutualists are really bad at repelling antagonists and vice versa. Um, circumstantial evidence across a bunch of different systems in plants and animals suggests that these types of trade-offs might be really common. My lab is really interested in the evolutionary consequences. Today, specifically, I want to think about the ecological factors that might shape this trade-off. And specifically today, I'm going to talk about the role of priority effects, um, or in other words, historical contingency in species interactions. So we tend to think of priority effects as playing out in the background in an abiotic landscape. So you might think about the role of um, historical contingency or priority effects in determining how this community of plants assembles in this abiotic landscape background. When we think about priority effects, um, priority effects simply predicts that the order of arrival influences colonization outcomes. And in general, studies of priority effects tend to see two broad patterns. First, we know that early colonizers disproportionately shape community assembly in these systems. And second, early colonizers are often just more likely to establish because they get an early toehold in these environments. But because I study interactions between hosts, mutualists, and parasites, I'm particularly interested in how these types of processes might play out when the landscape is a host. So in other words, when these things, when the arriving organisms are microbes that are colonizing another larger macroorganism. I think in this case, we need to modify our expectations from priority effects in a couple of important ways. First, we might expect that hosts influence colonization success, that they have a vested interest in the outcome and so, given that, this, that we know this occurs, we might expect hosts to actively facilitate <coughs> mutualists by upregulating the physiological processes that they use to establish mutualism. We also might expect that hosts suppress parasites by upregulating immune activity. However, many host genes play a dual role in regulating mutualists and parasites. Um, so, for example, we know that hosts downregulate immune function when they're establishing mutualism, and we know that they've co opted. Mutual, or parasitism genes, immune genes to regulate their mutualists. So this suggested to us that if a mutualist and a parasite arrive at the same time, the host might struggle to regulate them independently. So in this study, we set out to test two things. Um, first, we wanted to know whether the order of arrival influences mutualist and parasite colonization success. And second, we wanted to ask whether arriving with a parasite <coughs> suppresses colonization by mutualists or facilitates infection by parasites because of this crosstalk between how both of these interactions are regulated. So we studied this, we studied these questions in um, the legume rhizobium mutualism. For those of you who aren't familiar with the system, it's incredibly cool. Um, so in this mutualism, legumes, we study specifically the legume Medicago truncatula, um, receive fixed nitrogen from these mutualistic bacteria that they house in specialized organs on their roots. In exchange, the host provides these bacteria essentially to the house in these nodules, as well as carbon. However, these bacteria aren't the only things that live on legume roots. If you dig up a legume, you're likely to see structures that look suspiciously like nodules, but a little bit different. For over 80 years, it's been known that these so-called false nodules are actually formed by a parasitic nematode. And these structures look so superficially similar to people 
that um, as recently as 2018, the Missouri Botanical Garden warned gardeners not to confuse these root knots caused by nematodes with nodules formed by rhizobia. So in my lab, we specifically work on root knot nematodes in the genus Meloidine. Um, and studying this tripartite interaction is a really effective way to get these questions for a couple of ways, or for a couple of reasons. One is that work that I was not involved in has already shown that these interactions have a shared genetic basis. So plant genes that are involved in regulating this mutualism are also involved in resisting attack by these parasites. Then when I was a postdoc um, with John Stinchcomb at the University of Toronto, I was able to show um, that there's actually a genetic trade-off between mutualism and parasitism in wild collected metacogo trancatula accessions such that metacogo plants that invest in the mutualism are most heavily infected by parasites. So we think this is likely ecologically and evolutionarily significant. Okay, so to test for a role of priority effects in the system, we set up a greenhouse experiment with genetically variable metacogo trancatula lines. We started out with two week old seedlings, so these are pretty young plants. Um, and we then manipulated mutualist and parasite arrival time and a factorial design. So we either inoculated plants with rhizobia first and then nematodes, with nematodes first and then rhizobia, with both early or with both late. We then allowed these plants to grow for another seven weeks and then harvest them, harvested them at three time points so we could track the progression of these infections through time. Um, and at each of these time points in each of these harvest cohorts, we collected phenotype data on above and below ground <coughs> biomass, as well as the number of nodules and galls as proxies for mutualism and parasitism, respectively. Okay, so I'm going to start out by asking whether early colonizers were more likely to establish. And I'm going to address this question by comparing um, treatments in which rhizobia arrived first, followed by nematodes, to the treatment where nematodes arrived first, followed by rhizobia. So before I show you the data, I want to orient you to this figure. On the left, I'm showing you the outcome for mutualism as measured by the number of nodules that these plants formed with bacteria. On the right, I'm showing you parasitism outcomes as measured by the number of galls that they formed with nematodes. And then along the x-axis in both of these figures is harvest cohort, which you can think of as time, essentially. So in the context of the rhizobial mutualism, we found that overall late arriving rhizobia colonized better contrary to what we expected. So you can see this if you look at the plants that were inoculated with rhizobia second. By the end of the experiment in our third harvest cohort, they formed more nodules than those that were inoculated with rhizobia first. I should say that I've adjusted these values for root mass, such that what you're looking at is the number of nodules and galls per gram of root to remove the zombie effects of plant size. Um, the other thing that you'll notice though in this figure is that rhizobia always colonizes that all the plants in our experiment form nodules and they all form an appreciable number of nodules. This is exactly what we would expect given that we know these are mutualist and that the plant is promoting this association. With the parasites, we see a qualitatively similar um, pattern, although there are some important differences. Um, so we also found that parasites that were inoculated second colonize these plants better, um, but with a couple of exceptions, they were the only successful colonizers of these groups. So when we inoculated these plants with parasites early, overall, we saw very low infection. Okay, so second, we asked whether simultaneous arrival inhibits mutualism and facilitates this parasitism. And to remind you, the reason we're asking this question is that we expect that there might be some sort of genetic or physiological crosstalk between regulating one of these environments and regulating the other. So we tested this question by comparing the treatments in which these two symbionts arrive at different time points, or what I'm going to call arrival alone, and compare that to when these two symbionts arrive simultaneously at the same time. Okay, so the way I'm going to show you these data is that I'm comparing a case where rhizobia arrives alone to that when rhizobia arrives with nematodes, and doing that for plants that receive rhizobia in the first inoculation and plants that receive rhizobia in the second. So these data I've already shown you, this is simply telling you that those that received rhizobia second form more nodules than those that received rhizobia first. When we look at what happens when you inoculate simultaneously, we found that arriving with a parasite had a small effect on nodule formation, but that that effect was restricted to the case when we inoculated plants with both symbionts early. So in other words, when we inoculated relatively young seedlings. 
So now what I want to do is ask the same question for parasitism. Ask how arriving with a mutualist impacts the development of parasite infection. These data are set up in a similar way, so now you'll notice that these are plants that receive nematodes in the first inoculation and nematodes in the second inoculation. Here we see a qualitatively similar pattern again, but much more extreme. So in this case, we found that um, when we inoculated with rhizobia and nematodes simultaneously, we saw a huge decrease in gall formation, a huge decrease in the outcome of infection, but it was entirely restricted to, again, when we inoculated plants early, when we inoculated these plants relatively young. And in this case, not a single one of the plants in this treatment was successful, formed a successful infection by this parasite. Okay. So I want to summarize what I told you and then talk about what I think it means more broadly about how these effects play out on host backgrounds. Um, so first, we found that late arriving rhizobia and nematodes colonize best, contrary to, prediction, to the prediction that you might make when you're thinking about priority effects playing out on a landscape. So what I think this does is suggest a role for host development in regulating these interactions. Essentially, what we found or what we can't disentangle here is that these organisms simply colonize older hosts better. And so I'd like to think a little bit more carefully about disentangling priority effects in these host symbiont interactions from the role of host development and the host keeping process. Second, we found that simultaneous arrival inhibited colonization by both symbionts, but that this was only true early in the host life cycle. Um, and I'd like to emphasize here that contrary to our prediction that this would inhibit mutualism and facilitate parasitism, we actually found evidence for inhibitory effects of both interactions. So we suppressed symbiosis in general. So I think more broadly, my interpretation of our data is that priority effects play a relatively minor role in the legging rhizobia and, leg and legging nematode symbioses, and that this is consistent with the strong host control that we know exists in the context of both of these interactions. But I do think our data raises some interesting questions about how the host immune system or mutualism pathways in general might respond when a mutualist and a parasite arrive simultaneously. And I'd like to think about how those interactions play out over the course of development. Okay, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge the really fantastic undergrad, Audrey Burr, who led this project, as well as my lab chef, Steve Cassidy, who played a huge role in mentoring her. Um, thank everyone else who contributed to this and take any questions. Thank you. That's a great question. So the question is about priority effects with two mutualists as opposed to mutualists and parasites. And I think um, my initial reaction is that it would probably depend on how much genetic crosstalk or physiological crosstalk there is between those mutualisms and how much those two organisms are tapping into the same resource base in the host. So if they're completely independent, you might predict to see less, less of a trade-off or less interaction than if they're regulated by the same. Oh. Pretty old. Yeah, good question. Sorry. So we, what we haven't done is measure nitrogen content in the leaves, but we did this all on a background in sand. Um, so these plants were extraordinarily nitrogen limited, and so we did that so we could force them to affiliate with their mutualists and force them to depend on the mutualists as much as possible. Yeah. I have a similar question. So do you think sharing the nitrogen Because you might expect if you release dependence on the mutualist, you might decrease the degree to which you have immune crosstalk between those two interactions. Okay, thanks so much.